what I'm going to talk about today is uh, one of the main two projects that we have in the lab. And uh, they look a little bit different. Uh, one is, as you know, skin and pollution. The other is uh, red syndrome. And, but the first task that you have in this kind of, uh, of, uh, of talks is of sure, for sure the span, uh, attention span that, uh, as you, we know, after 10 minutes in a 50 minutes talk, it goes down. It goes up only when, uh, actually, you have uh, the word conclusion. <coughs> and uh, that's why you will have a lot of conclusion in the middle that will be just to keep you up and uh, not fall asleep. So I'm going to talk about uh, a rare disease. So, so maybe not many people know uh, this pathology. So Rett syndrome is uh, actually it's a pervasive neurological disorder caused by genetic mutation that is linked to the X chromosome. It was until, to un until 2012 a classified as an outing spectrum disorder. But after that, and since 2012, they found out, they, they main, mainly the clinicians, they has a peculiar aspect that cannot be any more associated with the autism. <clears throat> Who discovered Rett syndrome is uh, this guy that passed away in 1997, is Andres Rett, a pediatrician, that uh, in 1966, he published this paper that is actually in German. And uh, recently has been, uh, in 2016, all translated, you can find uh, open access uh, in uh, PubMed. But what it showed, you know, remember, it was just based on the clinical uh, feature. He, uh, among 6,000 brain injured children, he found that 22 children, girls, had similar aspects that combine them in a unique uh, you know, group of uh, pathology. At the time, it didn't, there was not a pathology. That's why it's called Rett syndrome from his name. <clears throat> and what he found, he found several typical clinical uh, you know, features that uh, he summarized in the paper. But of course, since this journal, this uh, uh, publication was published in German, it didn't have really big audience and big uh, uh, rumor, you know. But so it took 20 years, Hedberg, that published then in English a paper on Rett syndrome, where he showed a report 35 cases. And so that was the first time that now the whole world started to think about Rett syndrome as one pathology. And unique. And uh, what uh, these uh, papers put underlined was that uh, affects almost females. That is uh, the first uh, most common genetic cause of mental retardation in females. is a rare disease, one every 10, 15 me uh, females life births. And uh, there is no ethnic association. Anybody can be affected by that. <clears throat> the girls are called the girls with the beautiful eyes because many times they lose completely their ability to talk to the, uh, to the world. And so they have just the communication through the eyes. And that is kind of sad and, uh, and makes this uh, even more uh, uh, intriguing as a pathology to study. <clears throat> uh, if you look at uh, the genotype-phenotype correlation, Rett syndrome has been correlated to the mutation of mainly three genes, but now... Uh, one gene is, is not considered any more uh, Rett syndrome. So Rett syndrome is co re related to MEP2 gene and CDKL5. Uh, CDKL5 is even more rare than MEP2. <coughs> FOXG1 is not anymore considered, as I mentioned to you, a, a Rett syndrome related pathology. Phenotype, uh, the characteristics. So when we talk about uh, Rett syndrome, you usually talk about the typical Rett with the four stages of progression that uh, I will show to you soon. So as I mentioned to you, these are the gene. And as you can see, both CDKL5 and MACP2 are both localized in the X chromosome. That's why this uh, pathology affects only exclusively females. <clears throat> and uh, MACP2 is a transcriptional regulator. And 95% uh, of red patients actually are related to MACP2 mutation. So of the rare disease, only 5% is CDKL5. So it's, this is super rare, OK? But it's uh, even more aggressive as a, as a, as a clinical feature. 
as I mentioned to you, is MACP2 mutation. So there is not just one mutation. Has been related MACP2 to over 300 mutation. You have different kind. You have, you know, frame shift, deletion, nonsense, missense, and based uh, on uh, the kind of mutation, they can they can change the, the frequency. There are some that are more frequent, uh, uh, and some that are very rare. <coughs> but uh, the kind of mutation does not affect only the clinical feature and the severity of the pathology, uh, but also, sorry, but the, the kind of mutation also affect the, the severity. For example, <coughs> this kind of mutation, R133C, is, uh, is considered a mild one. Instead, the early truncated mutation are considered very severe. There are then late truncated mutation. In general, missense mutation are milder symptoms. <clears throat> this, uh, what, so you have uh, one rare disease with a lot of mutations. So it's kind of complicated. It's complicated also because the mutation is in a gene that actually is very important. It's a transcriptional factor that actually recognizes the, the methylated DNA and is able uh, to, uh, uh, to induce uh, transcript to repress transcription to activate transcription, and then to even have a role in chromatin loop formation and uh, in uh, compaction. So it's, it does everything. And when you, know, you have a gene that modulates the uh, uh, DNA, it means that can hit anything and have any consequences. The consequences of this pathology are, uh, as I told you, very severe. But the peculiarity of this pathology is that when the GERDs are born, are perfectly fine, are perfectly healthy. They are really no problems. In fact, this pathology is char characterized by these four stages, that is the early onset, six to 18 months. So up to almost 18 months and times, they have a normal development. They grow, they start to say a few words, they start to use their hands, they start to try to eat you know, by themselves. They, you know, they do all what they have a, a normal child of his age does it. But then there is a rapid regression, and usually this doesn't concern too much the, pa the parents because we all know, uh, either because direct experience or not, that usually child, when they, they learn something, then they go down a little bit, and then le they learn even more, and then go down. So the first year, year and a half, even if there is this regression, the parents are not very, very concerned. But then this keep going, and so usually the uh, analysis and uh, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the disease is, uh, is discovered around between two and four years. And then you have uh, the third phase, that is between two and 10, where you have you know, uh, really atomic dysfunction. Uh, these kids uh, usually have, uh, they show, they are very hard to, to manage, they lose their ability to communicate, uh, to walk many times. And uh, then we go to the late motor deterioration over 10 years, that is even um, uh, uh, compared to the Parkinson-like Parkinson pathology and completely decrease of mobility. So, <coughs> uh, in general, you have an impairment of a cognitive function, you lose the ability to communicate, you have uh, some movement, the stereotype movement, one is classic in red syndrome is a hand wash, they always do that when uh, just sit, <coughs> and uh, a perfusive grow failure. But although we know all these aspects, there is no cure for red syndrome yet. <coughs> And uh, the only thing that we, we and, and the, you know, the doctor try to do is just to manage the symptoms. Symptoms that are anxiety, uh, seizures, sleeping, apneas, you know, keep them quiet, uh, more calm because they are very, a very aggressive child many times. And uh, today, this is just 2000, uh, uh, updated in July, these are the clinical studies that there are on red syndrome. As you can see from the, um, from the drugs that we are using, is are just try to work on the symptoms, make them sleep or make them less anxious or prevent uh, seizures. The only big thing that is happening in the last few years is this from Avexis, that actually is trying to have started gene therapy Tri uh, clinical trial where they try actually to rescue the MACP2 gene 
and so to make the, uh, the, these girls healthy again. But it's still in the preclinical development, so we are not even in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in recruitment. <coughs> so said that, <coughs> although a rare disease is pretty well studied, but if you go back in history, actually in 1994, for example, there were two papers on red syndrome. I think that in 66 was discovered, so it was not too much. But uh, today there are all, almost 4,000 papers published on this rare disease. In 1999, we reached around 60 papers. And that was because in 1999, the gene associated to the pathology was discovered. So that was much, much later when Andreas Rett discovered the pathology. They really understood which gene is associated to Rett syndrome. From here, there was a big exponential development of papers or studies on red syndrome because found the gene, everybody were very optimistic, we will find the cure. And unfortunately, this was not that easy. And in fact, uh, today there are no cures. Although, you know, there are over 200 papers published in the last few years on this uh, rare disease. Again, it's, it's not diabetes, it's not Parkinson. This is a rare disease and you find over 200 papers published on this pathology, but still no cure. The problem is that, uh, you know, there is a, a, a very a missing link between the mutation that you have and uh, the clinical feature that you have. So we do not understand what, why this mutation of this particular, uh, you know, damage leads to that uh, features. Because if we could understand that, we could at least intervene at that level. Many, I mentioned to you that there are several clinical features of this pathology, and uh, one that has been uh, developed in the last uh, 10 years is uh, actually the, uh, the presence of a redox imbalance in, uh, in uh, these patients. Uh, and that was, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm lying, it's not really in the last 10 years, because the first paper that talked about uh, altered redox homeostasis in these patients is actually by Andres Rett. Uh, they said that the uh, post-mortem brain had less glutathione and ascorbic acid, vitamin C, in, in the tissues. And after that, you know, you have 10 years that they showed that the vitamin E in serum is also lower. And then 2001, there is uh, this uh, oxidative stress in red syndrome. But these are the only three papers where we are talking about uh, oxidative stress in red syndrome, but never follow up. We are all three different groups, and uh, maybe at the time we are just using current currents and not PubMed, but still, they did not uh, communicate, and it was uh, died here. After that, since 2009, uh, I, uh, I was lucky enough to meet uh, uh, Joseph Hayek, that I will also acknowledge at the end, who is, uh, was the head of a, a child uh, neuro hospital in uh, Siena. And uh, he is, uh, actually worked with uh, Andres Rett in his past. And he is one of the world uh, uh, mm, big knowledge in, uh, in Rett syndrome. And since this uh, oxidative stress, he was interested. I was organizing a conference uh, in Siena at the time, and so he approached me. And since that, we worked a lot on Rett syndrome, on this new aspect that is a uh, redox imbalance. And what I would like to show to you is uh, actually a summary of what we have done. So uh, essentially, we uh, try to understand why these patients have this oxidative stress damage that doesn't relate to MACP2 mutation at all. <coughs> the first, so we came out, this is the first paper that we published uh, 10 years ago now, <coughs> where we took uh, serum from patients and we just measure. What we did uh, was uh, over 60 patients. We measure many of the markers, and uh, I will call these markers many times, I recall these markers many times. Many of the markers, so-called oxidative stress marker. One is uh, non-protein-bound uh, uh, iron. Are, this is plasma iron, this protein carbonyls, isoprostans. And we measure all of them. As you can see, all of them were higher in red syndrome. So confirming and uh, clearly uh, nailing down that this oxidative stress damage is in red syndrome. But that was not enough. Actually, if you correlate 
this parameter with the severity independently of the different methods that you use to calculate the clinical severity. But we, but currently, there are three methods, Pineda, Perse, and Care. All of them correlate, you know, so the more oxidative stress damage you have, the worst was the clinical features of these patients. <clears throat> so that uh, really made this uh, uh, study uh, very interesting for the future. After that, we uh, showed also that uh, in typical red, there was an increase of another marker that I will recall many times because it's, I don't consider that anymore just a marker, but it's actually a, a, a signaling molecule. It is a 4 hydroxy nonenal, which is an uh, unsaturated aldehyde. We found that in, uh, in, in red syndrome, you have a higher level of this in plasma. And uh, just to recall you, 4-hydroxynonenal is an aldehyde that derives from the peroxidation of omega-6 fatty acids. And what it does, once it's formed, it's not just dyed, uh, but it can be conjugated with glutathione, and you get rid of that. But also, it binds to protein. And when it will bind to protein, it will change the function of the protein. That, that's why I want to call that not just a marker, but it's a signaling molecule, because it will change the function of your molecule and maybe bring lead to damage. And actually, foragenine was even increasing during the different phases of the pathology. As I mentioned to you, you know, there are four phases. If you look at the the, uh, the, um, um, with the progressive of the disease and of the stages, we have a clear significant increase of the level of 4 hydroxynonenal making this a very good marker even for this pathology because as you understand, you can, uh, un uh, um, and, uh, you can uh, un uh, see if the patient has a red syndrome only by the clinical feature. So what they see it, they have to understand if it's autism, if it's a problem with ca characterial problem, and then they will say, okay, no, this is red syndrome. But the only proof you will have only with the genetic you know, uh, work. So we saw that the uh, foragene was going up, and uh, but the, sorry. So, this, so what we have from the first part of, this, of the talk is I'm mentioning to you that there is a in increase, a clear evident correlation between oxidative stress mark and clinical severity. And that was also increasing during all the stages of the pathology. So we have an oxidative, oxidative damage and red syndrome. They talk to each other, but still we don't know why. So we move from human, we went to cell. Just to understand mechanism is good to have a, a cellular model. And as a cellular model, we were lucky enough to be able to get biopsies from the patients. <clears throat> you know, take the biopsies, isolate the fibroblast from the biopsies, and have the, fi the, the fibroblast in culture. And then try to understand what happened in these cells to better uh, investigate the mechanism. If you do this, the first thing that we want to make sure is that they are actually similar to the patients. So we, uh, as you can see, we measure again 4-hydroxynonenal, and in the cells, in the fibroblast, we have an increase. And that confirms what I showed you earlier in plasma. So it's a good model. So it has, is a, is a very oxidized model, is our oxidized cells. So it means that they resemble the pathology. And even if you use the fibroblasts to, <coughs> to reprogram them through the IPS and differentiation and then to neurons, and uh, you, know, you do all these passages that I know it takes maybe 45 seconds to show you these, sli these slides, but to have those cells, it took two years. You know, you have, uh, so the, the, the fibroblast becomes neurons, and you measure 4 hydroxynonenal in these neurons derived from fibroblast, again, increase dramatically. So, means that really this mutation somehow leads to oxidation. And, uh, and that was uh, a confirm of the previous work. But being in the redox biology field, you have to understand what makes this so oxidized. So there are different things that you can measure. One, we try to understand if mitochondria O2- superoxide <coughs> is uh, increasing. As you can see, this is you not know, the classic uh, for electron reduction of oxygen to from oxygen to water. And uh, in the middle, you have a, a, a um, superoxide, anion superoxide. And this, as you can see, is increasing in red syndrome. This is, maybe you don't appreciate too much with the light, but you have a quantification here of the red dye. But uh, <coughs> so, O2 minus increases. 
we measure the other oxidative stress, uh, oxidative stress mediator, that is hydrogen peroxide, and also hydrogen peroxide increases. Okay, why? That's the problem. Why we are not only measuring the damage, but we also are measuring also the molecules that will lead to the damage, but we don't know from where they are coming from. So <clears throat> there are different sources of ROS in the cells, as you know. One of the most studied in the last uh, uh, 30 years is the NADPH oxidase. There are different isoform, but this is just to show you what uh, NADPH oxidase, independently if it's uh, the constitutive one, that is LOS active, or the one inactive where it needs the assemble in the cytoplasm of all these subunits, and then we reduce oxygen to adenine superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, as you can see. So this is a font of hydrogen peroxide. So one thing we want to say is, is this more active in red? So do they actually increase their own endogenous ROS production? And actually, yes. What we found that NOx activity, and this means measure all the isoform of NOx, because this is just the activity of the enzyme, increases tremendously. And here, just to show you that you have also an increase of the protein that are, uh, have a key role in the assembling of the enzyme and make it work. So <clears throat> again, so we found that one source was this enzyme that lead the, the, the cells to be uh, so oxidized. So we know that if there is a damage and you have, you know, you have increased oxidative stress, so you have lipid peroxidation. Lipid peroxidation, for, for example, for AGE is one of a, of, a, of a mediator. What can do, as I mentioned to you, oh, sorry. Wow, where are we? Here we go. Uh, it can bind to proteins. Now, if you are lucky, this is recognized as an improper protein, can, can get ubiquitinated, it goes to the proteasome, and you get rid of that. If you are not lucky, or you have too much of that, this is, is no will work, and the protein will be a, pro a modified protein that can maybe lead in uh, cell dysfunction. So one thing that we wanted to measure is, does the proteasome work in these cells? So can they get rid of broken uh, proteins. And uh, as you can see, is, uh, to measure the proteasome activity, you need to measure three different enzymes activity. One is caspase-like activity, trypsin-like activity, and <coughs> chemotrypsin-like activity. And as we see in red syndrome, they were significantly lower. So it means that they not only increase the damage, but they are not able to get rid of the damage. <coughs> and so it means that this will lead also probably to the cell dysfunction. So we are here. So all this, unfortunately, <coughs> it, it doesn't work as well. So you have more product going through this pathway and that you have higher chance to have the cell dysfunction phenomenon. But proteasome is not just there to destroy proteins. It talks to other organelles. And one organelle that really is in direct contact with the proteasome has been shown to be the mitochondria, which makes sense because, as I mentioned to you earlier, we had a hint of a mitochondrial, not really dysfunction, but the OCU minus that I measured earlier is so-called mitochondrial OCU minus, the red dye, just to... So we want to understand if also mitochondria has a role in this, uh, in this pathology. And, uh, <clears throat> by Seahort's uh, uh, technique, we saw that actually the uh, red syndrome, either for basal respiration, reserve capacity, and max respiration capacity, was impaired, was not as good as the normal cell. So mitochondria, uh, it doesn't work as well as we expect. So this supposedly, since uh, mitochondria is one of the, uh, is the highest, I think, source of uh, ROS, endogenous ROS in our body, means that this could be another source of ROS, not only the NADPH oxidase, maybe we found another source that you know, comes from the inside and damage the patient. And in fact, if you look at fibroblast mitochondria, they the crystal look very messy. They are not the classic mitochondria that you find in, the, you know, in PubMed or in, like in, the, your, in your book, high school book, you know, the nice with all the crystal. It looks very messy compared to the nice mitochondria that you have in controlled fibroblast. And uh, if you do a mitotracker, that is a technique to actually highlight my, the mitochondria in, uh, in these cells, what we found, we found the red syndrome had lower number of mitochondria. They have lower, but bigger volume. So they have less, but they are big. And this being big is not a good sign for the mitochondria because maybe it's vacualized or, or, it's re or doesn't really work proper. So uh, being big in this case is not really a, a, a good uh, 
a good sign. So we have less and big, and this confirm that. This is in fibroblast, but also in PBNC, if you take lymphomonocyte from this patient, say you look at the mitochondria, you can see, look, this is the classic, uh, you know, mitochondria that you have, uh, sorry, in the normal cells. And look how messy, sorry, this is normal cells. See how nice all the crusty? And look at here, all messy. <coughs> so also in PBMC, this is very evident. So this, since a genetic disease, and say we took diff two different kinds of cells, it confirmed that it's generalized to all cells. We can assume that. And in fact, if you take uh, PBMC, you do a gene array, and I'm not showing the data of a gene array, but just to show you that one of the cluster that came up on uh, these cells were all gene related to mitochondria. So really, this mitochondria uh, organelle in red syndrome doesn't work. So confirming that this can be one of the source of the damage that we have in the cells. But if you talk about mitochondria, one important moment of the mitochondria is actually the so-called you know, quality control, which is the mitochondria is able to say, oh, mm -mm, it's not our cell is able to say, oh, this mitochondria is damaged. I don't want it. This is good. I keep it. So what happened is, uh, you know, in this uh, fusion fission mitophagy, what happened, as you can see, mitochondria they can f fuse. Then if there is a damaged one, we were able to, through the fusion, to, uh, to eliminate the, the, the damaged one. And the damaged one, through the so-called mitophagy, which is the autophagy in, in mitochondria, you will get rid. And that is what the cell does to, to, to keep uh, uh, its efficiency. So we want to measure, to see if there was an effect because if you think, uh, if we find less mitochondria but bigger, maybe one of these processes is not working. And so you just accumulate bigger mitochondria but are all damaged. <clears throat> and in fact, what we found, the mitophosin, that is one of the fusion protein, was less in, uh, in red syndrome was as, a, as a protein but also as a messenger. And this also uh, mitophosin too. <clears throat> Not only, but also OPA1 that is very important for, again, for the fusion because recognize the, the crystal and make them fuse together. Also, this was impaired in, uh, in red cells, in fibroblasts, as you can see very significantly. And not only, but also the mitophagy was impaired. So they are not also able to get rid of the damaged one because parking, for example, that is involved and pink one that are involved in this you can see the protein is less, the messenger is up. This is like they try to cope with this, but something is happening. And maybe what happened between here and here is that you have a normal protein, but then maybe you have an oxidized post translational modification that will damage the protein and then it will not work anymore. And even, you know, P62, that is a marker of autophagy, there is an increase of P52, P62 in the red syndrome, it's the autophagy is not finished. It's like a, a stock. And in fact, may, maybe you don't see this too well, but if you look at controlled fibroblast, you have a, a lysosome dye and the untreated cells and this is a mitophagy dye. When you, um, uh, you know, when uh, you merge the two, you have a yellow color, but you, I believe you can appreciate here. But this, you don't have a yellow color here. It means that they are not able to finalize the mitophagy. So they, the, the, the broken and the damaged mitochondria is stuck in the cell, and they are not efficiently able to get rid of that. And this was just uh, recently um, uh, uh, confirmed by this uh, is, uh, you know, you have to, I'm kind of old style, you know, I like Western blood, PCR, or immunofluorescence, but you have also to keep up with the uh, new techniques. And we start this uh, project with uh, proteomic data meaning. So what we did with uh, a, a, um, a collaborator that is TLS uh, in Italy, we give them uh, three controlled cells and four red derived cells. They put all together, they did all the crazy algorithms that very hard for me to understand. We did like 500 Skype. I think the next time I need Ahmed to help me. And, uh, <coughs> and what they did, they did this diagram. They show that there are around 793 protein and among them 664 are, uh, overlap. And they, that is just one of the 65 pages that they sent to me, is that they, again, you find the difference between, significant difference between control and RET in mitochondrial proteins related. So they have less. Okay, 
<coughs> said that I told you a lot of measurements, but still I didn't tell you if oxidative stress is a cause or is a consequence of this pathology. So it's you find oxidative stress and that is just the end, or if you rescue the oxidative stress, they are better. So to do that, you have to change the model again. So we went from cell to animals. And that was a nice collaboration that we did uh, all over the world, starting, of course, the most important was Professor Guy from Edinburgh. Because, you know, just to convince, this is a good model. So animals has been shown that the rest patient severity based on the mutation, actually, they can be translated to the severity of the animal with the exact mutation. So this is just to confirm, you know, this is phenotype severity, so increases, you know, with age. Uh, these are the age of the animals. As you can see, you know, there are some mutations that they are even die after eight weeks. So it means that the model, the animal model, is a good model to study uh, red syndrome. And we did this. We took uh, different, mod uh, different animals. We took the knockout, so they don't have MACP2, the 308, that is actually has a truncated mutation at the 308. And then there is this, the, the stop Y and nesting cray, that actually is the rescue model, that this was the, the nice part of the study. So if you take the animal, and uh, you know, just to show you, these animals are nice because they have really the development they, of, of the pathology. I told you that there are the four different stages. Also here, you don't have the four, but you have the two stages. You have a pre-symptomatic, so the animal, it doesn't show very sick. And then you have the symptomatic, where it shows that it's sick. So it's, it's good because you can maybe intervene on the pre-symptomatic and maybe uh, extend this, the pre-symptomatic, that could be a very good result. <clears throat> so if you, so this is, was a one rep, so if you make it to knockout, if you look at this marker that I mentioned to you at the beginning, uh, oxidative stress marker, look at all up in uh, the pre-symptomatics. So already up before they are showing they are sick. And they are even more higher when uh, at nine weeks when we actually we are, have uh, symptomatic animals. So that confirms what we saw earlier. You have uh, a oxidative damage in the plasma of the patients before that they are even show that they are sick. This is for these animals. And also for the 308, we have more or less the same uh, pattern, as you can see. This, they last longer, but uh, you know, while these after nine weeks die, more or less nine, 10 weeks, these are up to 40, uh, 54 weeks. And again, you have more or less the same pattern. Now, this was not only in brain, but also in plasma. We found an increase, so like in the patients that we found in both animals, knockout and 308. But the, the nice part comes here. And uh, if you take the rescue model, if you don't reactivate the gene, you have, as you can see, all these markers that are uh, oxidative stress markers are up significantly. But if I reactivate the gene, boom, they go all down. So it seems that somehow this gene is really direct connected to the generation of oxidative damage. That was the first evidence, proof, that this is connected. And that, of course, gives us even more strength to f continue into the molecular mechanism involved in this pathology. So what, uh, uh, that is the other conclusion to make you awake, is that the alter there is an alteration of the redox balance in also in the marine model, that these precede the clinical manifestation, as we saw in the patients, and the reintroduction of the functional MACP2 gene, it works. It makes them back to the state level. <clears throat> but when uh, you talk about oxidative damage, oxidative stress, uh, you have to always mention other words where they go together, you know, <clears throat> and this inflammation. You know, this, uh, I like to, uh, to cite, uh, cite uh, Urzini and Forma that are also friends, uh, that, uh, you know, where there is uh, a redox physiological homeostasis disruption, you have also a development of inflammatory states. So the question was, do these patients have a, an inflammatory status? Because they don't look inflamed. So we did this study. We took a serum and we checked some cytokines. And we found that all these cytokines were actually up in these patients. And again, they don't look you know, uh, inflamed. 
And this was confirmed also if you take PBMC and you do a PCR, all these genes were significantly higher. So the messenger and the protein and the protein in the plasma were higher. So they have this situation that we called subclinical inflammation. In the sense, they have a higher level of inflammatory markers, but they don't look clinical inflamed. And many other papers from us and other group have shown that. And actually, even more recently, for example, Hode, that uh, the, the 9 and 13 Hode are marker, so are, can trigger inflammation, markers of inflammation. They have been shown just recently here, we did the study here, that in red patients, they are much higher, confirming that. Now, if you have a redox taste, altered redox taste, an inflammatory situation, there is something that we like to call ox inflammation. There is uh, something in the middle that we are really interested in it. And it's actually called inflammasome. Because inflammasome is, 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 is actually a pathway that is activated also by oxidative stress. It can be even perpetuated by the oxidative stress damage. So uh, a little bit busy this slide, but uh, just to, to, to take you, you know, slowly on what is the inflammasome in case you have not been in, involved in this. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a system that is there uh, to protect us from pathogen is activated by different uh, uh, stimuli. Can be the pathogen associated molecular partners, for example, LPS is one. Can be also particulate in general, so pollution can actually do it. <clears throat> and can be also endogenous damps, like damage associated molecular patterns. So when you have some damage in your, in your cell, they can activate it because there will be a way to get rid of that. So what happened is that one is characterized by two. Uh, moments. One is the priming that involved NF-kappa B mainly, that is activated. It transcribed through the genes that are involved for the inflammasome. Once you transcribe through the genes, you have the proteins. Then you need the second stimuli, that could be, for example, ROS, that will stimulate the assembling of all the proteins, and they will make the scaffold that actually will be then responsible for the cleavage of Procaspase 1, and Procaspase 1 will then activate the prosatokines, and the cytokines will be released in the plasma, and then you have this inflammatory response. In some cases, it goes even worse, because if you have activation of a gas dermine, gas dermine will make holes in the membrane, and actually leads to death of the cell, that actually is called pyroptosis. So we want to understand if inflammasome is involved in, uh, in, uh, in red syndrome. So if you look at, so I told you that NF-kappa B is one of the main uh, triggers. And if you look at cells as a state level, look, the activation of NF-kappa B in red cells is super high already. Like constitutively, they have a higher uh, activation of these pro-inflammatory tr uh, transcription factors. And if you stimulate, I mentioned to you that LPS or ATP, because ATP is a, is a damp, it means that when the cell breaks, it releases and is recognized as a stimulus, and, uh, and inflammasome is activated. If you stimulate with them, while the control response and increase, red cells know. They are already at the plateau. We don't respond. We are already inflamed. We are already full blast. And uh, in fact, this confirmed by the, one of the last cytokines, that is uh, one of the last pathways of the inflammasome, activation, which is the release of IL-1 beta. As you can see, in the control, it goes up with the, with the stimulation. But in the red uh, cells, it's already high. And after stimulation, it does not respond. So that uh, confirms what uh, we have been showing now. And then we measure other proteins that are part of the scaffold. You know, One is ASK. I don't want to bother you with all uh, these names, but just you know, to confirm that. Also, this is very high. It doesn't respond to the stimuli, while the control cell, they well respond. And it's confirmed also by Western blot. But that is not enough. When you need uh, an assembling to have uh, an enzyme that is activated, you have also to make sure that the proteins are not just increasing, but they also bind to each other because otherwise it does, the, the, the scaffold is not formed. And, uh, and as you can see here, there is a control not stimulated, control stimulated, red not stimulated, red stimulated. Unfortunately, the light is too bright, but here there is a quantification. What happens is that the control will respond to the stimuli, and you have uh, the yellow color that tells you that they are assembling, 
But what happened in the red, you the yellow color stuff from the beginning. They have the inflammasome already assembled. So they not only have the genes already up, but they have also that assembled. But, <clears throat> and that, uh, this is the, if you quantify the NL, NLRP3 and ask colocalization, as you can see, is already high, it doesn't increase anymore. And this is the protein. But this is in cells. So, but if you have uh, this inflammasome activation in the uh, cells, do this lead to an increase inflammasome uh, result or, and uh, uh, readout in the plasma? So we went to patients. In the patients, what we did, we took the serum and we measured IL-18, which is one of the end markers of inflammasome activation. It was significantly higher. We measured ASK, and also this is increasing. But one important, very important thing of ASK is that not only we need the protein as is, but we need that this protein makes oligomers, like here. Okay, so we need all these oligomers because that will tell you that is the complex is, is formed. And if you measure the oligomers in the plasma of the patients, it increases. So you really have the inflammasome constitutively activated in the, these patients. This is the run of a gel and this is a, the quantification. And honestly, this is, I didn't even know that we could measure the oligomers in the uh, plasma, but you know, I, I'm not the smart one in these studies as are other people, so it's, uh, I'm just here to, to, to tell you what they do. So uh, if you, this is another conclusion, another summary. So if you look, this is controlled cells, fortunately they need to be faded. Anyway, this is NF-kappa-B, this is an LRP3, these are all the other subunits. As I mentioned to you, they need to go all together. So, you know, and they are all separated, while in red syndrome, they are already all assembled. So if you have a, a stimuli like uh, ATP or LP, an LPS, start the assembling and they respond well how they should respond. But when you uh, stimulate this, the, red, the red cells, they don't respond. They have already full blast. So there is no way to modulate this. And this will lead then to the increase of inflammatory uh, um, condition in uh, the peripheral blood therefore in, uh, all, uh, in a systemic manner. Now, since I am a PHGI, I want to show you just a few last slides on the, a study that we did previously, that uh, the idea is, uh, can dietary intervention improve these patients? And please, I don't say that you can cure this disease with a diet. I'm just saying to improve their, their clinical feature, because I can tell you that uh, some parents, they have not had the chance to even go for dinner in 15 years alone because it's not fine to find a babysitter that can handle them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard. So if you make these patients a little bit more manageable and more calm, it is, is, a, is a change of life not only for the patients but also for who has to take care of these patients. And just uh, I didn't mention, this patient can live up to 40, 45 years. It means that parents, if they're still uh, alive, they're very old. And actually, they should be taken care of. But usually, it's the other way around. So it's a very complicated situation. So we did this study. These are two studies. One is we just took a early de detected uh, girls, you know, so stage one. We fed them with 20 patients for six months with uh, omega-3. <clears throat> Why omega-3? Why not? We thought that inflammation is correlated to omega-3, so we said, let's try. Also because it doesn't really need the clinical protocol and approved because it's uh, over the counter and it was easy to, to do this. So we, we did that and uh, we measured the marker that I mentioned to you. So what uh, we found we found that the clinical severity, this is unsupplemented red, and this is supplemented red. The clinical severity score went down. But was, what was even better, what improved? Improved the ambulation, the hand use, motor sit, independent sitting. You know, they could, uh, uh, the, the Joseph Ike was telling me, mothers were calling him and saying, you know, I can actually take her 
by hand, go to the bathroom, leave her in the bathroom, she would do what she has to do, she would call and go back. Before it was just a fight all the way. <clears throat> so think it's big change in life. And some improve even, look, non-verbal communication from five to zero. Some start to say few words. <clears throat> And even their respiratory dysfunction, because they suffer very deep and severe apnea during the night, that we think is also one of the cause of oxidative damage, because they go in hypoxia, also improve tremendously. And many other of the markers in six months went all down, as you can see, or markers of oxidative damage. So not only clinical severity, but again, clinical severity correlate very well with the, dam with the oxidative damage. Then we did the second study. The second study was uh, the older one, if we want to call it like that. So two, three, and four stages, <clears throat> 42 patients, and we supplemented them up to 12 months. And what we found, we found that also in this case, red, for example, markers of, uh, of oxidative damage were all uh, decreased in the supplemented group compared to the non-supplemented. <clears throat> Although many times you reach plateau already in six months, it was pretty fast. And again, there was a big improve of communication over time, somatic growth, walking, apneas, and clinical severity. So that is big improvement. And again, they are still red syndrome patients, but it's completely changed the life of the family <coughs> with this. And uh, even recently, you know, we show that even the other uh, 13 other, here we go, uh, was, uh, that is, uh, I'm over time, no, on, what, oh, come on, oh, yeah, here we go. All the supplemental with FUFA was going down. Here is not significant, but still you see the trend. So again, you can really maybe help these patients also with that. Remember, Hoda is, is also actually a trig there is a paper, a trig for the inflammasome activation. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, let me go here. So we have this idea, <clears throat> and this I'm concluding, <clears throat> that uh, in the red syndrome, we have different situation. We have a mitochondrial dysfunction, the NADPH oxidase activation. We have decrease in, in key so-called antioxidant molecules. In pair of anti the oxidant enzyme, I didn't have the time to show you, but also this is impaired. And all of this leads to this damage. But remember, we, they are not born with the clinical manifestation of red syndrome. So we have the idea of the overloading damage theory. So when they are born, or when they are conceived, you, it's like you have a garage that is empty. And uh, while they are growing and form, even at the fetus level and then to the, to the baby, what happens, you start to fill the garage with damages. But you are able to classify well, or, you, or at least there is a no on your way. <clears throat> what happens is that if you continue, the damage is so overwhelming that it will not be managed. And so that will lead to what we call loss of proper functions of the cell. And that would explain, actually, the four stages where you have a from one to four, this that is actually an increase of the damage that you have in the cell. So I think I'm done here also because I have a few minutes. And you, know, you don't have 70 slides if you don't collaborate so <clears throat> for a talk. So what I, I want to say that uh, you know, this work is a summary of a lot of collaboration, a lot of friends. A lot of things are going on. We are very excited about that. But I like, first of all, thank Joseph Hayek that uh, is really now, he retired, but still is after the patients. They look for him, they go for him, and he has the biggest da database of samples ever that there is in Europe. And actually, thank to him, we have, I think, a, a collection of over 200 different cells, vials of different patients. <clears throat> Then I would like to thank Alessandra uh, because actually she is the red syndrome in my lab because I'm, I know less than what she does. <coughs> and, uh, and because she knows so well red syndrome, she was actually awarded at the S Society of Free Radical Research Europe this year for the Catherine Pasquier Memorial Award. That is the most ambitious and prestigious prize that the SFRI Europe 
can give it to you. I didn't get it. So, <coughs> and uh, then, of course, sorry, sorry, I have to thank the lab. You know, without this, I will, I cannot even, even pipe it anymore. So, it's, uh, you know, they are, they are great. I'm so happy to have them. Uh, as you can see, the names come from all over the world. We have only one American. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, but, you know, we, we really enjoy. It's really fun. But the last and not the least, I'd like to thank the Red Syndrome girls, because without their <clears throat> biopsies, their samples, they willing to try to understand what's wrong in them, we couldn't go further. And now I want to finally thank you for your attention. Thank you.